Okay, so we are all on here. All right, well, there's a few more people jo joining in. Janeta, I'd like a copy of the recording when it's finished. Yes, yes, that will go out to, uh, to everyone. Thank you. So, great. Um, we'll just give a couple more minutes um, for people to join. And in the interim, I'll just go ahead and introduce and welcome everybody um, to our COVID-19 and finance panel. Um, at the core of My Money Workshop's mission is the idea or the knowledge that all people can learn to manage their finances. Our mission is to educate people to manage their finances and to learn to make informed financial decisions. Um, as Financial Literacy Month closes, and as this pandemic continues, we are reminded that our mission is needed more today than it has ever been. We are very thankful to have today a panel of our experts, a subset of the My Money Workshop Corps of Volunteers today to answer you know, all the pertinent questions that we've been receiving um, in previous webinars, sessions, and things like that. Um, and so I, I, I'm just very excited to be able to do this for, for everyone today. Um, a couple housekeeping um, details. If you have a question, please share them um, with us in, our, uh, in the chat box, and we'll be managing those um, throughout the, the seminar. Um, I will continue to admit people um, into the webinar. Welcome, Laura, we just, uh, just joined. Um, so I will continue to admit people as they join. I will uh, close the meeting for participants around 12.15. Um, so, but we can get ahead, go ahead and, and start. Um, so with that said, um, our panel today is uh, being moderated by Eric and I'll leave it to Eric to introduce yourself um, after we go through uh, um, some introductions from, of our other panelists, we will get to those questions. So again, use the chat box if you need, uh, if you wanna answer or ask a question. Um, so Eric, go ahead. Thanks, Janeta. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Eric Prochnow. I uh, have worked in investment banking and private equity for about eight years after graduating uh, with a finance degree from the University of Virginia. I've been volunteering with My Money Workshop for uh, about a year now and I'm excited to continue working with the group. Um, so we'll start to, inter uh, start to introduce the panelists here. So we'll start with Kathleen Riley. Great, thank you, Eric. Hi, my name is Kathleen Riley. I am currently a banker. I work with Patriot Bank. I'm a branch manager and an area manager. So my job is to help my clients when they have any kind of you know concerns or general banking needs, as well as motivate my staff. And I do a lot of uh, volunteer work, particularly with my money workshop. I believe I've been volunteering with this group for about four or five years now, something like that. So this is right up my alley. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kathleen. Now we'll pass it over to Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Brown. It's great to be here today. I've been, for the last 25 years, I'm a self-employed tax practitioner and business consultant. So if you have any quick taxes, uh, questions on taxes, and I also implement um, accounting systems and internal controls. I've been volunteering with My Money Workshop for, I think it's going to be two years this summer, and I am an alum of uh, Mercy College in Doxbury. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now we'll pass it over to Badil. Hi, everyone. Badil Janjua here. Um, I'm relatively a new volunteer. Um, joined My Money Workshop about two months ago. I've been, for the last eight years, working in the financial services sector. I work at Standard & Poor's and manage their um, investment management clients um, and the relationships. Um, and yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Badil. Now I'll pass it to Chip. Uh, good morning. I guess it's afternoon. Uh, I'm Chip Wagner. I've been at Merrill Lynch for, it's hard to say, 38 years. And I've uh, been a volunteer here for My Money Workshop for two or three. I think there's a huge need for financial literacy and happy to found an organization that uh, is a great outlet for me to try and help. Thanks, Chip. Uh, we'll pass it to Alan now. Hey, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alan Bay. I am an accountant. I've had a, about a 40-year career in various financial positions in healthcare organizations. I currently provide 
consulting to healthcare organizations, and I teach at Mercy College. I also volunteer for My Money Workshop, the New York Botanical Gardens. I'm on the board of the Scarsdale Public Library, and I mentor for SCORE through the Small Business Administration. Thanks, Alan. And finally, we'll, we'll pass it to Ramana. Oh, you. Ramona, you might be on mute. Well, we can, uh, we'll let uh, Ramona uh, introduce herself when, uh, uh, I guess when the technical difficulties subside. So we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and jump into the questions here. So uh, we'll start off with the first. So what is one thing you would want individuals to know about managing their finances in this current environment? And we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Kathleen on this one. Great. Thank you, Eric. So when I was thinking about this question that we received, you know, um, being a banker by trade, it's natural that I want to be a conservative when I think about my money. So one of the things I would think, and I, I have a 22 year old who has been furloughed from his job and he is sitting in my house every day, every day. And one of the pieces of advice I would give him is be conservative. You know, think about your spending. Do you, you know, you have the idea of wants versus needs, but maybe it's even more than that now. Like, do you really need to have a gaming, for instance, whatever thing he subscribes to? So, you know, now that he's got no money coming in, I, I really encourage him to really, again, try to be conservative, try to think before he spends money. Um, and also in his instance, he is one of those New Yorkers that is trying to apply for unemployment and one of those three bazillion people trying to get in. And he has, it took him four weeks to actually get the application through, and he's now suffering because he hasn't heard back. So again, be patient. And I know it's frustrating to, you know, be patient and try to think through that, but there are all those other people that are trying to do the same thing you are. So I think my two pieces of advice would be to be conservative and also be patient. Life is slowed down for everybody, and so too should our spending, I believe. And hopefully that will be a good piece of advice for people. Absolutely. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? <clears throat> I would uh, add that if you're faced with bills, um, some of them might be negotiable. And if you can negotiate the amount of the money you owe, why not do it? Yep, absolutely. And I would just add that if you don't keep a budget, now's a good time to learn that technique and start having a budget. So for anybody who doesn't work with a budget, I think now would be a good time to start putting, implementing that in their life. Yep. Okay, so we'll go to the, we'll go to the next question. So uh, this one, we'll, we'll start with uh, Elizabeth on this one. It's, we know that financial challenges lead to stress in your day-to-day -day life. Can you share an example of what individuals can do to limit the effect of that stress? So in general, for me, um, one of the things that I do to really reduce stress, whether I'm waiting at line, online in the supermarket, this is pre-COVID or anything that's stressful, is I just start to breathe. I just become aware of my breath and start to breathe. And I love the breath because our breath is with us all the time, no matter where we are. And when you just start to slow down and breathe, that calms the whole central nervous system. Um, I am... Uh, limiting my exposure to the news. I want to stay informed, but I don't need to be listening all day long. And I have found that once I have found that balance for myself, it has helped me, my sleeping is much better and I feel much less stressed out. Um, I like to spend quiet time in nature. So I'm getting out a lot and taking walks. I live in uh, Northern Westchester, so there's a lot of fabulous parks and just getting out for fresh air, spending time with myself. Um, and in general, just if you can keep yourself calm, and there's lots of science that shows you can make better decisions when you're when you're calmer. So those are my thoughts on reducing stress. That's great. I I would just uh, add that uh, specifically when it uh, when it comes to stress from you know financial issues, if, you know, going back to Elizabeth, what you said about budgeting, I think having some sort of you know having some sort of plan. Uh, you know, even if the variables change over time, just having a plan that you can reference and guide your you know, income and spending over these times. I think any, you know, any way you can to eliminate, you know, uncertainty and feeling, you know, somewhat, 
aimless or out of control, uh, I think is helpful during this time. So we definitely recommend budgeting and you know, creating a financial plan that you can follow and update. Kathleen. Um, I would add to something else as well. Um, one of the things for me is managing your routines. So do the same thing that you would do normally every day anyway. So maybe you're working from home, get up at the same time every day, exercise at the same time every day. And for me specifically when I think about money is I usually pay my bills when I get paid. So once every two weeks, I sit down and prepare and get my bills ready. Um, and that also goes with grocery shopping as well. And I, you know, I hear everybody freaking out about toilet paper, but I'm not gonna freak out until I have a paycheck and then I do my shopping and then I'll buy my toilet paper. So again, trying to, you know, maintain that calmness and that sense of routine. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question we received, what can you tell, what can you tell those individuals who have lost their jobs and have no savings? What are the actions they need to take to stay afloat? And we'll start with Elizabeth on this one as well. Um, I would call your vendors, all your vendors, and try to work out a payment plan. A lot of, a lot of vendors are always willing to work with you, especially now. Um, so I would do that because you don't want to get into a situation where you're considered late because then that starts to affect other things. Um, and I would reduce, going back to what Kathleen said earlier, is just be very conservative. Reduce any unnecessary spending and try not to add any new debt um, to your current debt. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone want to add there, anything to that? Oh, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, there are um, many companies that are offering um, moratoriums on payments and uh, the ability to stretch payments. And uh, if one is in a financial bind, one should and has money owed to these companies, you would definitely want to take advantage of those revised terms. Yeah, great point. One thing you might consider is, uh, as opposed to uh, credit cards would be the last resort, I think, um, you know, trying to, if, if you can suspend your, uh, if you're working to suspend your 401k contributions to uh, also stop any savings that you might be doing automatically and see if you can um, suspend your mortgage payments or your student loan payments if they are, as you said, negotiable. I would also say one point with that, if you're going to do those things, a couple of people have talked about that, make sure you contact a creditor and negotiate with them. Don't just stop making your payments because that could have an adverse effect on your credit. You're absolutely right. So this is actually a question received in the comments that's somewhat related is, um, you know, since the job market isn't great right now, what would you recommend that folks do to improve uh, improve resumes during this time, or for recent graduates, how would you navigate entering the job market right now? Um, I can answer that. Okay. Um, so some of you know that my previous life was working in the professional career development um, world. And I think right now what a lot of people need to look at is how you can um, not just be able to communicate the skills that you have learned that you have that you bring to the table now but to see how you can also pivot and um take on some other you know take a course learn learn another skill so that you can put that on your resume so that you can show that you're actively engaged in a job search in education um, as you are job searching i think employers are always looking for um, people, uh, employees, prospective employees who are entrepreneurial, who, you know, don't let these um, situations block them down. So definitely stay, uh, I would say, to stay on top of, you know, um, how to get yourself, how to communicate your, um, your skills to the best of your um, expert, you know, the best of your knowledge. And there are a lot of organizations out there that are helping people to communicate or to effectively update their resumes. I mean, you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay for, for those. So if anyone, I can actually, um, after I sent out 
the recording and all of the things out that these organizations that that do help um, the people with with um, helping to perfect their resumes but also to create a resume if you haven't if you're just you know a graduating uh, senior and you still haven't worked on that resume great thanks Janetta. any other other thoughts from the group on those questions the only one thing i will add um which i've done a few times in my career being laid off every now and then is volunteering is also a great way to as you say be entrepreneurial get out there and give of yourself and in your time to some other organization that's probably a little more challenging right now because you can't necessarily volunteer face to face but there are a lot of organizations that are looking for other kinds of help so it's worth you know checking some of that out it's also of note that a lot of resumes are now looked at automatically or online and so having keywords for the industry or kind of company you want to join having keywords embedded in your resume is very important so since a lot of people are home right now reviewing your resume in those terms is probably a worthwhile exercise alan what what would you recommend someone who may not know what those key terms would be for a particular industry how, how would someone go about you know, knowing what to put in the resume well i can speak for my healthcare expertise and what i would do if I was looking to get into healthcare, is I would try to figure what type of healthcare do I, do I want to work for an insurer, for a hospital, for a medical group, and then I would start looking at websites and look for commonalities in the kinds of phrases they use to describe their operations. Um, and I think that message might be transferable among various kinds of companies i agree i would say yeah if you look at the job description use the phrasing that they're using in their job description in your own in your own um, resume you can update your resume as often as you're sending out um, applications but deal you had a comment yeah, just I was going to say the same, you know, I think Alan, Ganeda, you both had um, great suggestions. LinkedIn is a great resource, not to know my platform, but, you know, you can definitely for the kind of firm you're looking for, you, uh, you know, personally, what really helped me is that I can actually, whenever I'm, I was applying for a new job, I could actually, you know, look up that title and see some of my peers that are already at that potential position and what attributes and qualities they have, what, you know, um, experience they have that just kind of like really helps you be prepared and ready for you know for your potential interview or for your resume tweaking before you know you apply for that position on a complete sidebar um something that you know this is not related right now to this environment but always you know i think more and more employers are paying attention to your social media so it's always prudent to be very careful about what profiles are public what comments are public so it's you know smart to take a look at that as well yeah absolutely So we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to the next next question. So this one we'll start with uh, Badil on. So how can you ensure that your credit and credit score are not affected by loss in income? Are there things that a person can do to ensure they don't lose out twice, both short term and long term? Yep. Thanks, Eric. So yeah, you know, obviously, ideally, you know, the situation would be either you're not incurring new debt on your credit card, or you know, you're paying the balance in full. That's obviously the best practice. Um, you know, if you have a, still are lucky enough to have a job right now in this environment, it's great to, you know, either pay it if like a monthly is too much, if you get paid biweekly, pay it off on a biweekly basis. I understand that the current environment, it may not be possible for many individuals. And in those scenarios, I'd say if, you know, um, you're unable to pay that debt down at the bare minimum, ensure that you are pay making the minimum payment. And even in the minimum payment, it's always good to do an analysis if you have more than one line of credit to take a look at your interest rates and you know an xyz company might if you have two credit cards might be charging you a lot higher rate on the on the debt usually credit card debt in general has the highest interest rates so it's just very it's smart to prioritize you know which one to pay down first or at least you know and as i think alan mentioned earlier it's really right now i'm i've personally noticed on a lot of websites that a lot of creditors are offering some extensions so as long as those extensions don't increase your principal amount significantly it would be worthwhile to take you know to take a look at those options um fico score in general just to add there 
you know, um, having debt on your account would usually have a negative impact on your credit score. But at the same time, it's not going to be as det detrimental as missing a payment without, you know, reaching out to the creditor. So you want to make sure that there's no negative impact on your credit report with late payments if you can avoid it. Thanks, Padilla. There's one more thing I would add too, is if, if you, something dire comes up and you need to make um, a very difficult decision, a good practice is to write to the credit bureaus and to get you one of your letters or one of your explanations on file. So any future creditor, when they're looking, will see that you had comments posted to your credit report and they'll see that it wasn't, you were just being flighty about it, something actually was going on or you wanted you know, the general public to understand that there's something specific that happened to you. So. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, so Chip, this one, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. So we receive a lot of questions about investing. So considering the current stock market uh, concerns, what's the one thing that individuals should know about getting started with investing? Uh, what, what should they do before, uh, before getting started? Well, most certainly we all know we've had uh, tremendous volatility. I've um, been in the market uh, for five uh, bear markets and they waited to save the, the worst for last for me. But uh, um, I always talk to my clients about their time horizon. I think it's so important. Uh, if somebody is <coughs> new to investing and they have a short time horizon, uh, I don't think they should speculate as the banker said, uh, this is not a time to speculate. Um, but if your time horizon is long, there may be opportunities. Um, I constantly tell people there's no get rich scheme, uh, get rich quick scheme that I'm aware of. And, uh, I've found virtually nobody who can time the market. Uh, we talk about uh, time in the market, not timing the market as being important. Um, I, I want to share with you my, my daughter who's tw 29 years old, some financial lessons I've tried to impress upon her because I, I think that women, uh, have particular challenges when it comes to investing. Uh, we all know that uh, women live longer than men, and that's, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, women also, this is unfortunate, I've shared this with my daughter, that women earn less money than men for the same work, which I don't think is fair. Um, women also take time off for caregiving, and that's um, something that's uh, not shared equally. Uh, Women also are more likely to become single parents. And also, uh, I am on uh, uh, the board of Kendall, which is a continuing living center. And there's also women spend the later parts of their life living by themselves. These are all challenges that um, uh, <coughs> press upon me the need for women to be more engaged and more involved in their financial decisions. and. Um, it's a challenge because of the fact of some of those characteristics I mentioned. So uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, starting early and being disciplined. And uh, um, one thing I've taught about in my classes with my, fund, my money workshop is, uh, is an emergency fund. And um, most certainly uh, it never has been more important than today. It's not an easy time now to have an emergency fund, but the rule of thumb is to have three to six months of living expenses uh, liquid. Um, most certainly we all wish we had uh, bigger emergency funds today than we might have had uh, three months ago, two months ago. Thanks, Chip. Can I, can I add a little to that? So I'm Ramona Thomas. I am a financial advisor with Ameriprise Financial. And so I had technical difficulties earlier, sorry for that. Um, Chip actually said a lot of what I would say. I'll just add a couple of things that Chip didn't say. So most of my practice actually focuses on women for the reasons that Chip gave. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say, going back to the question around investing and what people should consider, I do a lot of goals-based investment advising. So the very first thing I ask people is, what is your goal around investing? There's, a, There are a lot of investment vehicles that people don't hear about or know about from CNBC or MSNBC. Um, but the first question is, do you want to grow your investment? 
or do you want to generate income? Because there are different vehicles that do different things. Some will focus on growth, some will focus on income. There are also investments that focus on both. In addition to timeline, which Chip mentioned, are you looking at 16 years, five years, next year? Because that also determines what kind of investment vehicle I would recommend or that might be a good fit for you is also thinking about your risk tolerance. So people general, generally want higher returns. Higher returns mean higher risk for losing part of your investment or part of your principal. And so those are three things that I really focus on. What's your goal? What's your timeline? And what's your risk tolerance for return and or potential loss of investment? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rana. Uh, Badil, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I just want to add, you know, great advice from both of my peers. Um, just, you know, there are a few options, as you can probably tell from Chip and Ramona's comments. You can go the route of a financial advisor. You could go the route of like, these are, there are these like robo online advisements, semi-advising capabilities available today. You could invest directly. But really, I think the core thing, obviously, that we've covered beyond, you know, first of all, ensuring that this is not money that you need in the next year or two years or three years, having a longer term horizon. And number two, first, educating yourself on the market. So, there are great resources online just to understand the bare basics of how the stock market works, what are the different instruments. So I would really recommend, you know, these things really, you know, which route you take depends on your individual circumstances and your goals. But just starting with the core basics on your own, the internet is a great resource would be, you know, definitely one of the first places you want to start and learn a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And a question we've received uh, before that's, that's related to this is, yeah. How should you know someone who hasn't started investing yet, but you know still you know still has student loans, say, or has you know credit card uh, debt? How how does someone think about you know paying down debt versus getting started in investing? What, any thoughts around that? I do. Yep. I think that um, sink. <clears throat> pardon me. Sinking your debt takes precedence over building further wealth as long as you have an emergency fund or some resources that would tie you over in an emergency. Getting rid of the debt also gets rid of the associated interest costs. And I would recommend being debt free to someone who's just starting out. So I would concentrate on reducing and eliminating debt before I would start concentrating on building wealth. Thanks, Alan. Badil? Yeah, just to add there, I think that's absolutely great advice. Um, there are some r rare circumstances where, you know, um, maybe, and this is, you know, really unique, and it's like where I think you should definitely talk to someone. My Money Workshop has some resources. You can talk to one of us individually directly by reaching out. But, you know, there are those rare circumstances, for example, where you have a very low interest rate student debt with a long term paying horizon. At the same time, you know, you might start a job with a new employer that offers a really generous 401k match. So there are those considerations that really depends on your, you know, um, your individual circumstances, but definitely you first of all want to start with paying off your debt, then having an emergency and rainy day fund, and then think about investment investing. Thanks, Badil. Eric? Yep. Can I add something? I, I wanted to add something to the previous question. Sure. Um, loved what everybody said, but the, the only thing I wanted to add was for people that are new to investing, I would really, in addition, they need to educate themselves and learn. And one of the things that I would recommend that they learn about is dollar cost averaging. Because then, you know, when the market's up, it's down, you know, you don't have to freak out if you're just going in, you're hitting it at all different points consistently over year, many years. That should all level out and also to look into index funds they're not sexy but they can get you they can get you to the same end result thanks elizabeth so alan we'll, we'll send the next question your way to start so what is one thing you'd suggest to someone who wants to begin creating generational wealth and doesn't know how to start well when i hear the term generational wealth I think of someone who has already covered the basics. That is to say, they have an emergency fund. They might have some savings beyond. They have a stable uh, financial picture and control of their debt. And now they want to go on 
and leave money to their children, their grandchildren, you name it. That's to me is generational wealth. And the way that we approached that was we began with a very large company stock buying um, small chunks whenever we could. And we amassed significant positions in several companies. Um, 1990s were an eye opener for us in the tech bubble in that the, my wife and I each had separate brokers, but the advice was consistent. It's going to come back, buy more. And based on the amount of money that we lost in the 90s, we decided to go forward by ourselves without any financial advisement by anybody. So I would recommend someone to start a basic stock portfolio of both uh, established growth and value companies. And then as they're doing that, to amass as much financial knowledge as they, could, as they can, and then begin to diversify. Of course, to me, if you have money enough to leave to children or grandchildren, you've significantly elongated your time horizon and you can afford to edge more into so-called growth stocks rather than value stocks. So it's, it's a very complex set of decisions, but at the end of the day, I would recommend someone to amass as much knowledge of the market as they can and take 100% control of their own decisions. Thanks, Alan. Would anyone like to add to that? I can just add a little bit um, before um, you, Elizabeth. Um, I, I think for someone, I think we got part of this question um, was generated from a previous class that we had where um, with John Jay College, um, which was is primarily, um, you know, has a, a large number of first time college students, first time uh, you know, immigrant um, uh, population. And so as a, you know, Latina immigrant, you know, first time college student, da 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 da. Um, I, I think that Alan's point of educating yourself and learning as much financial knowledge as you can is key. Um, I think when, you know, in my experience, um, Latinos especially, we are very community driven. And so if there's someone in our, you know, extended community that needs help with their house or, you know, their grandmother's cousin's friends need something, we're right there pitching in. And I think that if we're thinking about generational wealth and how we're going to look at our lives in the future and to be able to retire differently than our own families, we are going to have to be much more stringent with how we shed, share our money um, and to keep our money close to us. And I think that's, that's sort of all I'll say. I'm sure everyone else has some, some other suggestions. I know Elizabeth, you had. Yes, I was just going to add again for me, general, generational wealth means you have a lot of money to pass on is I would have a good estate tax attorney in your life to help you with that as well. Right. I would definitely second that. Uh, having the proper uh, documentation, both a, a will, um, a, living, a living will, um, a healthcare proxy, these are all very important things to have. One thing that we've taught in the class that I think is great is the rule of 72. And there's no benefit for, there's no better thing for people to do than to start early. And I think getting some of the kids in the classroom to understand the rule of 72 and the benefit of compounding has been huge. And um, to have generational wealth, I think in most every case, someone has to start early. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Someone, someone mentioned in the comments that um, you know, just starting to understand the time value of money is a, is a helpful place to start when thinking about you know, growing your own wealth and then generational wealth going forward. So that, that definitely ties in. 
Can I just say one other thing? Um, so like some people don't think, they think because they can't put a lot away that they, they don't bother to do it. But even if it's a hundred a month or whatever, you know, if you can, and set things up on automatic. So if you can put, if you have money to save, have it automatically come out of your account and go into whatever the investment investment vehicle is automatically. When you set things up automatically, it just, it's, it's, it, it, it kind of puts you in a position where you're doing it and you're doing it regularly and you kind of forget about it because it's just built into your budget. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So next, uh, next question we'll, we'll give to Ramona. So what, if any, affect the socioeconomic markers such as, uh, as social, sorry, socioeconomic markers, gender, race, et cetera, have on managing finances? So I kind of tweak that question a little bit. I don't know that the markers have an effect on how people manage their finances. I think it's more about what people are exposed to. So race, gender, socioeconomic status, really in terms of how you're coming up, your upbringing, it really um, determines what you're exposed to in terms of access and, and information. What do you learn in your home? What do you have access to from community organizations, extended family? And you'll find that, you know, people from different backgrounds have access to different kinds of information. So there are kids who are in elementary school that know about stocks and stock portfolios because their parents have them or their grandparents have them or they inherited um, finances. And there are others who don't. And that's, you know, that's, so I wouldn't, I, I don't want people on the call who attend the classes to think because they're from a certain background or a certain zip code that that's going to predetermine how they manage money for the rest of their lives or how they live. Um, it's just educating yourself and accessing information like what money, my money workshop provides and sort of changing that so that the more, the more, you know, the better you are. Knowledge really is power around finances and every area area of life. Thanks, Ramona. And I would add to that as well. I agree with your point. You know, what we are talking about here in, in most of this material is really skill building. And everyone has the same ability to build a skill. It's really about how much effort you put into it. Are you going to practice what you're learning? Are you going to, you know, make it so that it's part of your, um, the fabric of what you do every day? So I think everybody has the same opportunity in that respect to build that skill. Yeah, Elizabeth. So I want to add another dimension to this. I agree with it, what everybody said, and I have that in my answer as well. But I'll just talk about a piece that for me was significant. So I um, grew up in a very um, low socioeconomic. My mother was a single mother. She was on welfare initially when she first became single. And so it was tough. And I'm the first person to go to college. And um, one of the things that I had to be, besides educating myself about financial stuff, which is what we're talking about here, I had to take a look at some of my old belief system and the old messaging that I got in a family that did not model good um, relationship with money. And now I, I'm also a life coach and so I, I blend these things together and I do coaching financial empowerment for women. And one of the things I really look at is your belief system. And so for me, I had to overcome the guilt of being more successful than my family. And some of my family wasn't happy about it. So that's the, their own dysfunction. But I had to really get over that. And it was a I had to work on that. There was guilt about being the survivor or the one. So sometimes there's a psychological piece too. So I just want to say every day is a new day to learn a new skill. And we just talked about that, to le learn things you never learned at home. But also be aware of the inner conversation that might be tripping you up when you, in, in different directions. Yep. Thanks, Elizabeth. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'll add to that, that that is a, one of the key things that when I joined My Money Workshop, I wanted us to add into our curriculum. And so you, some of you who've taught recently have seen a couple of slides on goal setting, um, you know, active goal settings, uh, values, and on um, limiting beliefs. I think that that, that is the biggest thing that, you know, and uh, Elizabeth, as you were talking, I was like, she is speaking to me. Uh, I think that a lot of people 
have these stories that they tell themselves and they don't know where they are coming from because, you know, as you, you saw your parents growing up and it speaks to what Ramona was saying, you know, if, if the parents had a, you know, stock portfolio, then that was part of the familial conversation. Um, whereas if you didn't, if you were in, you know, basic, you know, single parent home or, or you're, you know, systemically um, in, in, you know, the system, quote unquote, you don't see, you don't have access to, to that information and you internalize that. Um, and so it's been very important for us to build that into the curriculum of My Money Workshop. And as we continue our curriculum, we will add more and more of that. We've, you know, we've added um, chair yoga sessions to, to our previous um, workshops, which some of you have been at, um, breathing exercises, because as you center yourself and as you understand where you are within yourself, you can then take that, take ownership of where you are and, and move forward. I think it's so key. So that was it. That's it for our prepared questions. And I think we've, we've answered everything in the group chat so far. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, one comment that was just mentioned uh, for recent for the recent grads question, uh, you can start a blog or vlog or podcast that can speak to your skills. So there's um, you know there's there's sites such as Wix.com or Coursera that can help with uh, you know either developing skills or showcasing your skills. So thank you, Dane, for that. Agreed. Um, one of the things that we did not talk about, and as, as perhaps some questions do come through, um, we did not talk about insurance and the importance of insurance with even with building um, generational wealth. Um, does anyone have any anything to add uh, on that topic? You know, Ganita, actually, when people were talking, I actually did think about insurance that in, that didn't come up um, as a response to the question, but there are families that use insurance as a way of generating wealth to pass down to the next generation. So um, what I would say about insurance in addition to that is that it's just really important to have and it's part of the financial conversation that's often challenging for families to have because it feels very morbid and that we're you know, talking about death. Um, but if you think about it from a protection point of view that it really is there to cover assets um, that you have or assets that you don't have that your family may need. A really good example, someone buys a home, a spouse unfortunately dies, a life insurance policy can be used to pay off the balance of the home so that the family doesn't have to leave the home. So you can use um, insurance in a lot of different ways. And especially right now, living through coronavirus, it's one of the things I've been talking a lot with clients and just every conversation, it's making sure that, and we talk, touched about this a little bit with estate planning, making sure that your sort of documents, your final wishes are in order, um, power of attorney, just asking people if something happens to you, who's going to make healthcare decisions for you? Um, just really simple things that families should be talking about, making sure your beneficiaries are up to date. People think, well, I don't have a lot of money, I don't need a will, but, I won't have an estate. If you have anything to pass on to the next generation, your family, your children, that's an estate. Um, and we have very public examples of, you know, famous people like Prince who didn't have a will. And I know an estate planning attorney that always says, if you don't make a decision about what happens to your assets, the state will. So while they're very difficult conversations to have, this is actually the time to do it. I think those are great points. One thing I find in talking to people is people are kind of resetting their priorities, meaning, you know, as we, the, there are things that we wanted to address, but in this uh, environment, uh, I think it's a fast forward that we are finding, I'm finding clients uh, wanting to uh, uh, examine their core values and, and uh, address some of the things that they had in the past put off. I'm, people are much more receptive to uh, getting a power of attorney on their form, on their, on their account. People are much more receptive to 
planning while in the past it was um, the last priority. So resetting your priorities is something, a common theme that I see among uh, our clients. Great, thank you. Yeah, I thought that that, that um, as as we were all talking about that that popped up. Um, as we sort of get to the last couple few minutes of of our time together, um, one of the other key things that I that I feel is important is, and and I think some of the what we talked about today um, gets to it is is um, financial literacy and the family that family dynamics. You know, how do we, as, as you know, I, I'm not a parent, I have too many nieces and nephews to count, but how do we use them, um, what, how do we use what we know to, to teach the young, younger generation, to prepare the younger generation to make better decisions? And that's for everybody. Well, I, ha I have um, three, three daughters who um, are probably uh, not very financially literate in terms of their own finances. And I have tried over the last 10 years, I would say, to help guide them with the idea that eventually they would be able to competently handle their own affairs. And I've been somewhat successful at that, depending, the three girls are all different. Um, but I think passing your knowledge um, is very, very important. And teaching those close to you, I remember when they were in grade school, how hard it was to study with them and so on. But this is something that they all seem to want. So passing along the knowledge and the skills of how to operate um, in, in real life, so to speak, um, has proved much more rewarding than helping them study in junior high school. Um, no, I was just going to add to that and say, I think family conversations are really important. So it's a great time for parents to talk to their children about emergency funds, about what's happening in the household right now, whether you're working or if you're a business owner applying for, you know, one of the PPP loans, like whatever is happening in your household right now, it's a great opportunity to educate the young people. Um, in your home or your nieces and nephews about what you're doing, how you're managing, and ways that you can help them. And I think there's certain transitions um, that really make sense. First job, you know, graduating from high school, going to college. And I think as adults, we have a way of, we have a responsibility of modeling, even in how we gift, right? So you can give gifts to the, to the 529 plan as opposed to, you know, gift cards to department stores. I mean, so there, I think there are ways as adults that we can model for younger people in our family. And I think if you're a younger person on this call, talk to other people in your family, talk to your professors, talk to the instructors on this call about what are they doing for, you know, checking or investing or saving or insurance. I think people are willing to talk more now than, than ever. I'd also like to add um, that, so I have a great nephew who's 10, and my niece lives week to week. She grew up with parents that lived week to week, and I've talked to her about what does she want, what does she want for her son. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of research that shows the younger you teach people, in this case would be children, how to monitor, how to... Um, how to not have to always feed their impulses. So how to have delayed gratification. That's those are the words I was looking for. That when you learn delayed gratification, the younger you learn it, the science shows those people are so much more successful with, in many areas of their life because of delay, and especially financial. So when I'm teaching these My Money workshops, and a lot of times I have adults, who are learning and they said, I wish I knew this. I'm trying to talk to them, talk to your kids about this, even if they're little. You're, no child is ever too young to learn about um, money. And Beth Kobler, Koblener, I'll put her name in the uh, chat. She has many books, but she has one that's called um, Make Your Kid a Money Genius, Even If You're Not One. And it really shows that as early as four or five, you can start teaching your kids. Like I do with my granddaughter who's four, 
you know, she doesn't get whatever she wants in the stores. I'll say to her, oh, I have to, grandma has to save some money. And I'm always telling her, what do I, what do you do? I teach people how to save money. I'm always talking about saving money. And now I'm teaching her how to, if we give her some money, she has three bangs. One is to save, one is to save, one is to check for charity to help, and one is to do whatever she wants with. But always that it's not to be spent immediately. And so delayed gratification, especially in the society we live in, we're, it's all about bye, 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 bye. It's very difficult. If you can learn it young or you can teach it young. Um, and that's why we also have in the workshop that thing about needs versus wants. Because get it really helping us adults who didn't learn delayed gratification to help us getting in touch with our value system. And what's really important to us when we quiet all the chatter around us, when you start moving in alignment with your um, um, values, it's a lot easier to say no to the many things that are tempting to us. I was just going to add, yep, um, here. So I think Elizabeth covered part of it and um, great points there, Elizabeth. Um, I just feel like, you know, there's a, unfortunately in our society, there's a culture of like putting financial matters under the rug, especially when it comes to children. Don't discuss finances in front of them. Don't talk about, you know, credit. And it's usually that idea that, oh, you know, they're going to go to college and they're going to figure it out. And I feel like I'm not saying that's everyone, but I've personally seen that a lot around me in my family. So I just feel like as my you know uh, peers have said, like just starting small, small, starting with savings, talking about credit, talking about these different financial terms. And I know in some cases it's a matter of access and obviously, you know, um, unfortunately it's, you know, it's more accessible in some communities and households versus others, but just, you know, really starting to talk with your kids about this, these items and not shying away from talking about financial matters is very critical to building their financial literacy. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it's funny because I, my nephews come spend ev almost the entire summer with me, either part of it or the entire summer with me. And by the end of the summer, they all know how much it costs to feed a family of four. Because there's, there's, there's three, there's three of them <laughs> and myself. I'm like, gentlemen, this is not, this is not an everyday thing. Um, so they, they, um, after a while, they, they actually say, Okay, so if, if I say, okay, let's go to the movies and, and, and order in, I'm like, well, well, we can cook. And, and then, you know, it's, if you, I've involved them in the whole conversation and they, they, they're great. They're, you know, I'm, I hope that when they go home to their parents, they're able to keep that, but we'll see. Um, awesome. Well, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, does anyone want to add anything? I know we've covered a lot of topics today and I want to thank you. I've been sitting here fangirling over all of you and your answers because it, you know, it's really just endemic of, of the, the, the amazing skills that, that our instructors bring to, to My Money Workshop. Uh, and I'm just so excited that people can see this um, and hear you all uh, and sh share your, your expertise. Um, but does anyone have anything else that they wanted to um, comment that we maybe didn't touch on today or, or that you feel it's important for people to know, especially now with, with this whole COVID-19 and, you know, a lot of people not having jobs and uh, 30 million people out of work. Um, that is just insane. So I'll leave it up to you. One thing I guess I could say that I've said in class, the, you know, the more you know, the better decisions you make. And I think My Money Workshop is an environment where, where we educate and help people make better decisions. And uh, so I'm a huge fan that the more you know, the better decisions you make. And uh, I think My Money Workshop is all about that. And also I would just like to say that it's never too late to start making changes in your life and getting back to the psychological piece. A lot of people beat themselves up because of the mistakes they made and it, to the extent that it's preventing them from making better choices and moving forward. So, you know, one little shift can change the whole trajectory um, of your life in that direction. So it's never too late and what's in the past is in the past and the point is let's move forward. And I, I would say that for those of our listeners who are working, whose employers have 401k or 403b accounts available for them, taking advantage of them when you're young to the maximum amount you can makes a lot of financial sense. 
Um, so I would advise people who are working and have access to those accounts but haven't yet applied for them to apply for them immediately. Um, one last question on you here from uh, Shweta is, are there any books or um, any other literature that people, that you would recommend people to, um, to read? Uh, you know, is that other book, actually, the, uh, do you want to mention, Elizabeth, that other book you mentioned earlier? Well, Beth Koblener, if you Google her, you'll find, so this is the, so she wrote a book, How to Make Your Kid a Money Genius, even if you're not one. And it's great to see how you can start teaching young kids. And then this book, Get a Financial Life, um, is also one of her books, but if you Google her, then you'll find all her books, and they've all been New York Times bestsellers. So she, I did a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there, but I just like, I really love, like, enjoyed her, her the variety of her books, yeah. the perspective she comes from. I would suggest for mine personally a book that I just recently read is Principles by Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is like a renowned um, American investor. He runs Bridgewater Associates, and he, I think, it's a book that he wrote that really is around how you should, you know, it talks about his own reflection in his own life, but it talks about like how you can manage your personal finances and your life and, you know, from a financial perspective. So I, I would recommend that and I'll add that in the comment section. Thank you. I think the um, big online brokerage firms, not pushing anybody, Fidelity, Schwab, et cetera, have more information uh, available on their websites, generally, if not completely for free, than you could read in a lifetime. And just to add on that, I absolutely couldn't agree more personally, you know, being a user of one of them without naming any of them, there's some great resources and great tools. If you're, you know, a Nova's financial investor, you can get access to financials, you can get access to research, screening, a lot of capabilities. But, you know, as Chip said, you know, this is a great time, especially if you have more time on your hand, knowledge is power. So the more knowledge you can gain, the better financial decisions you'll make. Great. There's also um, this book uh, for parents. It's uh, a children's book, The Four Money Bears by Mac, Mac Gardner. Um, and they're just like illustrated, you know, the, there's the, the saver bear, the, the investing bear, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a really cute book for children. Um, and there's plenty others we'll, we'll actually continue to share. There's also podcasts that people can uh, listen to. Um, for parents as well, we'll share those on our socials as they keep coming up because I can't remember the actual uh, names right now. But um, uh, we will we will be sharing that with everybody. But um, I think we're sort of at the last couple of minutes. We'll say thank you all again. Um, we have just I think shared so much information today. Um, we'll be posting this video um on our socials and we also will um be sharing that with um our clients so that they can share with the participants that have come to our workshops before because they'll need this information too but also um future participants as well so thank you all i thank you thank you great thank have you. a great rest of the day bye-bye bye everyone take care thanks everyone Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.